Hello, and welcome to Extreme HTTP Performance Tuning. My name is Mark Richards, and I'm joining you today from Kingston, Jamaica. Now, I've worked in cloud computing in a number of different roles for almost a decade now. But prior to this project, most of my performance tuning work was really focused on higher level abstractions. This was really my first low level systems performance tuning project. And I mentioned that because I want to kind of help demystify systems performance tuning for anyone who's interested but inexperienced. You really don't need to be an expert just to get started. Like anything else, it takes some curiosity and a little persistence, but you can absolutely learn as you go along. Tools like FlameGraph and BPF Trace have completely changed the game and made this kind of work much more approachable. And there are a number of new eBPF based tools on the horizon that make things even easier. I genuinely think that we'll eventually get to the point where looking at flame graphs in production systems will be almost as commonplace as looking at logs and CPU metrics. So this project was basically an accident. I started off working on an unrelated idea, and then along the way I just kind of tripped and fell down this crazy optimization rabbit hole. This is a condensed version of my year-long journey where I started with a simple high-performance API server and then used a combination of flame graph and BPF trace to analyze and optimize the entire stack. Now I did this experiment in the cloud, specifically on AWS. The cloud model really facilitates this kind of exploration because it provides on-demand access to cutting edge hardware. I used a four CPU instance on the server and both the client and the server were in the same cluster placement group to guarantee low network latency. I used a tech empower JSON test as the reference benchmark. For those who might not be familiar, tech empower does these semi-annual performance comp comparisons using various web frameworks. The JSON benchmark is pretty simple. It just expects the server to encode and return a hello world JSON object. For the API server software, I started out with an existing implementation that was built using Libreactor, a event-driven application framework that's written in C, and I contributed my modifications as I went along. Now this presentation is going to be a little bit of a whirlwind tour just because of the sheer number of optimizations. I'll pick a few to highlight, but if you really want to dig into the details, you can visit my blog and read the deep dive post there. It even includes a CloudFormation template that lets you run the benchmark for yourself. All right, so this table lists the nine optimization categories that I initially used, and it shows a percentage improvement for each in one column and the cumulative throughput in the other. It's a pretty solid illustration of the power of compounding when you're doing optimization work. Throughput moves from 224,000 requests per second at the beginning to a mind-blowing 1.2 million requests per second by the time we get to the end. Now this is still the same table, but for the purposes of this presentation, I'm going to batch those nine categories into just five groups. First, we have the application level optimizations, which they're a group all unto themselves. And that's followed by me brazenly disabling a trio of built-in security features, and those are highlighted in yellow. Next up in green, we have my favorite pair of optimizations. These two are all about streamlining when and where data gets processed. And then in pair purple, we have a pair of what I call my detective work optimizations. Finally, in pink, we have a catch-all group of minor tweaks. Well, before we dive into any of the optimizations, we're just going to take a look at the initial state. Now, like I mentioned, we start out at 224,000 requests per second. That's already really fast. The latency numbers are also really good. P99.99 is just 1.32 milliseconds. On the surface, this looks more like an after picture than a before. Now, when we compare Libreactor to a few popular servers and frameworks, things look good there as well. Nginx and Netty are both known for their performance, and Libreactor is right up there with them. Just looking at this bar chart, you might think there really isn't much room for improvement here. Now uh, here, we have a CPU flame graph of our initial state. Flame graphs provide a unique way to visualize CPU usage and identify your application's most frequently used code paths. I customized these flame graphs so that the user line functions are in blue, while the kernel functions remain flame colored. Now, as you can see, most of the CPU time is spent in the kernel, sending and receiving messages over the network, while the userland code is pretty evenly split between parsing an incoming request and dispatching a response. One thing to keep an eye out for is the spiky, needle-like lo looking stacks that are distributed throughout the graph. Those represent interrupt-related processing from incoming requests. So now we're going to get into the details of the optimizations themselves, starting with the application-level optimizations. Now, the very first optimization, optimization that I found was dead simple. There was no sophisticated analysis. I just ran HTOP and realized that only half of the available CPUs were being used. Now, apparently it was the result of a debugging change that was left in by mistake, and nobody noticed. Now, this optimization is what really kick-started the whole project for me. When I found it, I thought to myself, if something this big was just kind of hiding in plain sight, there must be more out there. 
So of course, I updated the application to run on all available cores, and that resulted in a 25% performance boost. Next, I made sure that the right combination of GCC flags were being used when compiling the framework and the application, and I got around a 15% boost from that. After that, I updated the framework to use the send and receive syscalls rather than the more generic write and read. Generally, the difference is negligible, but when you move beyond 50,000 requests per second, it starts to add up. Finally, I tackled pthread. Now, Linux pthreads have very little overhead, but again, you crank things up, overhead becomes visible. By default, Libreactor was creating a thread pool for DNS resolution, but the API server really didn't need it. So by removing that dependency, I was able to squeeze out another 3% increase. Altogether, this gives us a performance boost of around 55%, and our throughput moves from 224,000 requests per second to 347,000 requests per second, which is pretty big for our first step. Now, looking at the before and after flame graphs, the most obvious change is the reduction in width and height of the frames representing the user land code. The horizontal reduction indicates less time spent on CPU, and the vertical reduction represents more aggressive function inlining, courtesy of the compiler. Now, handling more requests also means we're handling more interrupts, so that's why we see the interrupt needles on the graph growing. A search for the interrupt function name shows that it moved from 15% of the initial graph to 27% of the current one. So next up, I'm going to tackle the performance ahead overhead associated with a trio of Linux security features just by simply disabling them. Now, obviously, this is not a general recommendation, and a more nuanced discussion is definitely warranted. But we're going to kind of gloss over those details today so that I can focus on some of the more interesting optimizations. I want to make it clear, though, these overheads are exaggerated because of the extreme nature of this test. You should always properly evaluate your workload before you disable anything. So there are around nine speculative execution mitigations built into the Amazon Linux 2 kernel. I looked at each of them individually, but only five had a performance impact. So I disabled those five, and I got a 28% performance increase. On the syscall side, by default, the audit subsystem introduces a tiny amount of overhead even when logging is turned up. Thankfully, that can be addressed with a simple addition to the relevant config file. Now, independent of that, Docker also uses a setcom filter to constrain the list of syscalls that a containerized application can make. There's a small amount of overhead here as well, and I disabled it using the relevant CLI flag. Finally, we have IP tables. Now, disabling IP tables is not necessarily a huge deal if you're using cloud-native firewalls, but Docker relies on it heavily for network address translation. So for the purposes of this test, I disabled IP table support both in the kernel and the Docker daemon, but I can get away with that because I'm running a single container that's directly attached to the host network. So there's no need for that. Disabling this trio of security features gives us a cumulative performance boost of around 74%, and our throughput moves from 347,000 requests per second to 603,000 requests per second. The speculative execution changes don't really show up on the flame graph, but IP tables and syscall changes are pretty easy to spot. You can see the largest section for IP tables indicated by the arrow on the left, while the arrow on the right indicates the syscall functions that just get removed. Next up, we're going to cover perfect data locality and interrupt optimizations. Now, these two are about making relatively small changes that dramatically streamline when and where data gets processed. So in order to achieve perfect data locality, we're going to try and create distinct silos where each CPU gets paired with a network queue. The OS and the application are configured so that each silo operates independently with almost zero crosstalk between the silos. This focus on data locality improves efficiency by maintaining CPU cache warmth and eliminating lock contention. So the first step is to start a separate Libreactor process for each CPU in the system and pin each of those processes to a specific CPU. That part is pretty straightforward. The next step is to establish fixed pairings between the CPUs and network queues for both incoming and outgoing data. Now on the incoming side, we use receive side scaling to ensure that if a request comes in on Q0, then all IRQ processing for that request will be handled by CPU0, and so on and so forth. And then for the outgoing data, we use transmit packet steering, which essentially does the same thing in reverse. Now the third step for perfect locality is the one that's probably least well known. So initially, we were using SO reuse port to allow multiple server processes to listen for connections on the same port. But by default, SO reuse port distributes connections to processes randomly. So even though the IRQ processing was effectively pinned to a specific CPU, 
and it came time to pass the data to the application, our silo was being broken. Now thankfully, newer kernels have the option to distribute connections using a custom BPF program. Using this option, we can guarantee that the same CPU that handled IRQ processing will also be used when the data gets passed to the user space application, and thus we're able to preserve the silo. So now we've streamlined where the data is getting processed, so we're going to take a look at streamlining when the data gets processed using interrupt moderation and busy polling. So whenever a packet arrives over the network, the network card triggers a hardware interrupt, which of course interrupts whatever the operating system was doing. In general, that's a good thing, but when hundreds of thousands of packets are coming in every second, it creates significant overhead. To mitigate this, modern network cards support interrupt moderation. They basically delay interrupts for a short period of time and then raise a single interrupt to process, process all the packets that arrived in that period. Additionally, the ENA driver supports dynamic interrupt moderation, which automatically adjusts the delay to get the best result for the current request rate. Now the final component of our multi-pronged strategy is busy polling. So busy polling works by preemptively polling the network queue instead of waiting on interrupts. As you can imagine, if you combine busy polling with interrupt moderation, you can get yourself into a virtuous cycle where you're either preemptively polling for data or processing that data in your application and almost never getting interrupted. It's really important to highlight the extent to which perfect locality, interrupt moderation, and busy polling all work together. If you take away any one of the three, you'll see a much less pronounced effect. With all three combined, we get a total performance boost of approximately 77%. Throughput moves from 603,000 requests per second to just over 1 million requests per second. This is a huge improvement, and it really just boils down to streamlining when and where data gets processed. We really didn't change the application itself. Now, when we take a look at the before and after flame graphs, we can see a pretty dramatic change but it's mostly just a difference of where the IRQ processing is taking place. Soft IRQ processing is happening proactively instead of being interrupt driven. As a result, the ePoll stack has grown because this is where the busy polling is happening, while at the same time, the number of interrupt needles have dropped. Now, crossing the 1 million requests per second mark was a major milestone. Nevertheless, I still just felt like there was more gains to be had, and if I'm being 100% honest, I'd become a little bit optimization obsessed at this point. I was basically just going through the flame graph with a magnifying glass trying to find anything that could be eliminated. And so out of that, I have two detective work stories. But I really only have time to cover one, so I'm going to break down the case of the nosy neighbor for you, but just kind of gloss over the battle against the spin line. That being said, if you're into performance engineering stories with a hint of Greek tragedy, you should definitely check out the blog post for the full story there. So I'm scoring the flame graph and just looking up every function, trying to decide, is this function using more CPU time than it should? Eventually, I zeroed in on the dev queue transmit nit function that's at the top of the send stack as my next target. At that point, the function was weighing in at about 3.5% of the flame graph, which was noteworthy. And by examining the kernel source code, I determined that this function should really only be called if someone is basically listening in and getting a copy of every outgoing packet. Now that would be perfectly reasonable to expect if I was running something like TCP dump in the background, but I wasn't, so I had to dig deeper. So based on the fact that the function was calling packet receive, I was able to piece together that our nosy neighbor was an AF packet socket. This is a low level socket that's able to send and receive raw packets. It basically gets the option to see all the packets that come through our network interface, and then it uses a BPF filter to discard the ones it's not interested in. This is usually very efficient, but at 1 million requests per second, overhead shows up. Now, in order to identify the exact culprit, I ran SS to find out which process was using a packet, packet socket. And as it turns out, it was our friendly neighborhood DHCP client. But now, when you think about it, this makes sense. The DHCP client needs to be able to send and receive messages before the instance has even been issued an IP address. So it needs to be able to operate at a very low level. I was hoping that there was a way to get it to close the packet socket after acquiring the initial address and just use UDP for renewals, but that doesn't seem to be an option, so I had to take more drastic measures. Now, according to the AWS docs, once an instance is assigned a private IP, it's associated with that instance for life, even across reboots and extended stops. So since I didn't really need DHCP for that, I just disabled it after booting up. Disabling DHCP gives us a performance boost of just under 6%. Throughput moves from 1.06 million requests per second to 1.12 million requests per second. 
Now looking at our flame graphs, we see the offending functions have been fully removed. Our nosy neighbor has been successfully evicted. You can also see our next target, the raw spin lock, lurking there on the left side of the flame graph. Now, like I mentioned, we're just going to kind of skip over the spin lock story and jump to the results. Defeating the spin lock gives us a somewhat underwhelming performance boost of just over 2%. Throughput moves from 1.12 million requests per second to 1.15 million requests per second. This is what our zoomed in before and after flame graphs look like. Now, one might think there should have been a bigger performance boost from such a significant flame graph change, but that's a story for another day. Now, I categorize this final tree of networking optimizations as small improvements that help us squeeze out the last drop of performance, even though they negatively impact other common use cases. So first, we have generic receive offload. Now, that's used to aggregate packets and reassemble them before they get to the user land application. For this benchmark, I know that all requests can fit in a single packet, so I just disable GRO. TCP congestion control is used to optimize the flow of data across the network. Now, this is really important for unreliable networks like the internet, but a lot less important within our cluster placement group. So I had an idea. Maybe I should find the congestion control algorithm that has the lowest overhead in a congestion-free environment. As it turned out, switching from Cubic, which is the default, to Reno, which is the simplest algorithm, results in a small but consistent performance increase. Finally, <clears throat> while adaptive interrupt moderation is extremely powerful and versatile, it still adds a tiny bit of overhead. So using a relatively high static value gives us a small performance bump. Now these final optimizations combined give us a performance boost of just over 4%. Throughput moves from 1.15 million requests per second to 1.20 million requests per second. And with that, we've arrived at our final destination. I learned a tremendous amount working on this project, and I'm really happy with the final result. A 436% increase in requests per second, along with a 79% reduction in P99 latency, is no mean feat in general, but especially for a server that was already pretty fast to begin with. Now, to show our progress, we can take a look at the initial and final versions of the Libreactor code in light green and dark green, respectively, compared to some of the most popular and performant tech and power implementations. Now, this chart shows the servers running on an instance without any OSR networking optimizations. And you can see that the application level optimizations are just enough to take Libreactor to the front of the pack. This chart shows a rising tide of OS and networking optimizations lifting all chips. And it also shows how well they combine with Libreactor's optimizations, propelling the fully optimized Libreactor even further ahead of the pack. Now, the darker brown half of each bar shows the performance before the OSN networking optimization, like on the previous slide, while the top half shows what a significant impact those optimizations have had. So this is what I'm looking at in terms of next, next steps. So the first would be to upgrade from kernel 4.14 to 5.10. Now, last time I tested 5.10, I actually saw a 10% performance regression. Now, I have some theories about why, but I still need to do a little bit more investigation. Now, resolving that regression is key because 5.10 comes with some new performance features and support for newer technologies that I'm very eager to try out. The main one being IOU ring, which is really exciting because it should dramatically reduce our syscall overhead. And in this benchmark, we're literally doing millions of send and receive syscalls every single second. Now, on the hardware side, AWS is rolling out the full complement of their next generation instances using the latest processors from ARM, Intel, and AMD. I'm really looking forward to doing a three-way shootout between them. I'm also really interested in the concept of driving performance from the bottom up. The idea that we start with a super simple, high-performance implementation like this one, and then gradually add features while trying to maintain performance. So if, say, for example, we're using Rust, we could start with a low-level Libreactor clone, and then move up a level to a framework like Tokyo, and then move up again to something like Hyper, while trying to see how much performance we can preserve as we move up in complexity. So that's it for me today. Thank you so much for joining me. You can feel free to DM me on Twitter at TalawaTech, or reach out via my website, talawa.io. Thanks again, and take care.